Okay, we're going to talk about Asian eyelids. And this is going to be both for those that do Asian eyelids and those that don't want to do it and those that are too scared to do it. So we're going to talk a little bit about defining an aesthetic. I think it was important for me to have covered the last talk first because it's a similar aesthetic that I've, that I've imposed onto the Asians as well, which is the idea that today, I think across almost all races, the fuller, lower aesthetic of the eyelid is something that I find attractive. There's more of the operative word we talked about yesterday, which is preservation of ethnicity, which is preserving the epicanthus. And really, as I, as I said, I look at volume being something that's universal. I'll show you some of those ideas at the end. Um, I'm going to move forward here. So it's a low crease, it's a full contour that I think is universal in many, many respects. So the anatomy, what is it? Uh, just to review for those that are not uh, familiar with this, is that the levator aponeurosis does not attach into the dermis so what, for, to create a crease. So what happens is the postseptal fat slides down and creates a very full uh, eye, eyelid appearance because the fat is hanging lower in a narrow palpebral fissure. So the con and, and the thing that I've, since I'm so much into fat grafting, I've really moved away from the concept of actually cutting that fat out, but I actually just, since the fat is really not in excess in most cases, it's just too low riding. I'm probably one of the few people that do Asian eyelids without excision of fat. I just move it up. So the techniques are, as many people that practice Asian eyelids, that's how many techniques that exist out there. And I've really moved from the partial technique, partial incision technique over to the full incision technique, and I'll tell you why. So the evolution of strategy is that suture techniques have really never incorporated just because of the risk of uh, um, the tenuous nature of it and the fact that it could disappear after six months to a year. The partial incision technique has a lot of issues that I don't particularly care for. I don't think it's a bad technique, but in my hands, it's not the best. So I really use the full incision. What are the, some of the issues that I encountered with a partial incision? Fold loss. Because there's not a tenacious grasp of the levator to the skin, there's oftentimes a greater loss of it. And what seems like easy surgery, because it's just a tiny abbreviated incision, to find the levator through this, this little keyhole is much harder. The other thing that besides all this is, it's toward the end about the visible incision line, is that when you do a full incision, even in someone that has a crease, there's going to be a little enfolding of the skin when their eyes are semi-closed to close. But when the, it, it, the skin incision is abbreviated, you can see the stop-off point when they close your eyes. And if there's a little buckling of the skin, something doesn't look right. So that is really what I saw was when the eye was closed that it just didn't look so natural. So I've really moved over to the full incision technique. And in my opinion, I think it's a very, very nice technique. The major complication is just the fact that the patient has to go through a longer recovery time. Do that, how thick the uh, fold looks. Some intraoperative for the, um, pearls for those that do this. Uh, I you avoid long-acting sedation. I do like, if possible, give them a little propofol and knock them out. It's just very... It's just very anxiety provoking when a patient is having this procedure done. And the, I, I like to use a little bit of marcaine. And what I usually do is I use a single cc of half marcaine, half 1% lidocaine with epinephrine, 100,000. And I just bleb it across each side. I'll, I'll explain that more in detail when I get there. Always use symmetrical amounts of local. Very, very, very important. And the other thing that's important is not to thread the needle. Just raise little micro wheels. Because if you lacerate a vessel in that, plexus, you're going to create a hematoma. It's going to be very hard to read symmetry. And if you ever get that situation, just hold immediate pressure, obviously. Um, the other thing is as you advance with your procedure, when you get to the levator complex, you want to be very careful not letting anesthetic drip because if you get levator dysfunction, it's very hard to read symmetry toward the end of the case. Okay, so as we work, just work symmetrically. I always like to do part of one eyelid, part of one eyelid. I go back and forth a lot because it just helps me mentally keep track of the idea that symmetry is the key that we want to follow. And whenever we deal with, if there's a little less edema on one side, I will put a little more anesthetic the other side just to read the parity because you really want to keep uh, symmetry intact. Always find the fat. When you find the fat, the postseptal fat, you're in a clean plane, you're in a safe plane, you know you didn't pass it and hit the levator. So always look for that fat and you can do a little finagling and pushing to fenestrate it through the little hole. I'm going to actually show you what I'm talking about in a moment. And there's something called the pseudo-levator that my colleague Dr. Kim found in Korea, which is essentially all it is, is the posterior leaf of the orbital septum that you're opening up. And there's that little flimsy leaf that it would be nice if you could actually see the levator in full effect so you know you're getting more of a tenacious grasp there. So let's walk through the procedure. You mark it out. Whenever you mark, the, the lid should always be under tension where the eyelashes are at 90 degrees. And you can see I'm using my 
uh, dominant hand to actually retract back to create that per, uh, perpendicularity to the eyelashes as I mark it. This is a marked incision without pulling back and then as you see under tension that's what I'm trying to achieve to create in this case an inside fold with a slight slight flare to the outer tail. I want to talk a little bit about how to incorporate the idea of the aging Asian eyelid. I had a gentleman yesterday ask me afterwards, what do you think about that? And I said, I've got a technique that hopefully will guide you out of trouble, especially if you're not someone that, that wants to do an Asian eyelid. How do you manage someone that's 55, 60 years old that comes in for rejuvenation? They're Asian. If they have a crease, they don't have a crease, what do you do? Do you just go take skin? Do you do a brow lift? What's the best technique? So what I've done to make this easier for you is I've divided it into without a crease, with a natural crease, and with a man-made or surgical crease that was done before. So let's engage in the idea of the individual coming without a crease. What are the pitfalls with this? A lot of times I see people just randomly take some skin out. If you just randomly take some skin out of there, they still have a very narrow palpebral fissure because of the fat being low on the, on the uh, levator, and they really don't get much of a result with that. Plus, if you create an incision line that is now visible because there's no folding over that incision. If you go back and say, well then easy, let's go ahead and take some fat out. If you go to the postseptal tissues, take some fat out in someone that does not have a crease, you'll potentially create a random fixation that's not tenacious, but it's partially there and it looks bad and the patient even planned for that. So very, very difficult situation when you deal with an Asian without a crease and you don't want to actually make a crease. What I usually do, again, because I have a bias toward fat transfer, I'm going to do a fat grafting in that area. I don't prefer to actually cut the skin randomly, or I'm going to make a crease, or do that with a fat transfer. So, in other words, without a crease, don't just randomly make a cut or take some fat out. Either make a crease or inflate the eye further to create convexity using uh, a filler of some kind. Um, with a natural crease, this is the easiest, right? We can just treat them like a Caucasian. Just go and just take some skin out, take a little fat out, no problem, they've got a crease. Yes and no. The problem with this is, is you heard my aesthetic on a Caucasian is not to have a high crease. But if they have a high crease, it does exist in nature. You've got Nicole Kidman, you've got certain stars that have high creases you can see out there, and it's fine. You just change their identity a bit, but you're not gonna make them necessarily look artificial. With an Asian, you create a high crease, you're really in trouble. You're going to make someone look a bit weird. So I, if I'm, how do I do this? If the, if the skin is hanging over the ciliary margin, I'll take a little skin. But I, I, I will probably take, put a little fat transfer just to support the brow a little bit. If they've got a crease that's visible and it's above the ciliary margin, they're not getting any skin removal. It's just too much of a risk to take that crease too high and make it look artificial and an Asian. Aging eye, Asian eyelid with a man-made crease. You say, well, isn't that the same thing as a natural crease? And the answer is no. Because the problem is if you look back in the 1980s when something called westernization was very popular, it was a very aggressive, overzealous removal of skin, a aggressive removal of fat, very high creases. What happened over about a 20-year period is that crease started to fall. And they start to look sort of natural. But you've just got to lift the crease up to see that, oh my God, you take the skin out, you're going to unma unmask this very ugly high crease. Now how do you tell before you even lift it? You can tell because when you look at them, they just look a little fake and you can't tell what it is even though they have a low crease, uh, crease height. Here's the reason why. Their brow tissue has folded over their, skin t their, their eyelid tissue and it just looks weird to begin with. Just don't make them more weird by taking all that skin or lifting the brows up and exposing that bad prior result. And this is a lady here where you can see these multiple creases that are there, but it's a nice fixation. If it's a nice fixation of multiple creases, you want a cleaner look, just take a little bit of skin. So this is a very conservative upper blepharoplasty combined with facial fat transfer. Complications, I think you guys know about it. It's pretty much textbook. It's asymmetry. We're not going to get too much into it. And these are just some of my results. This is a, uh, when I was doing partial incisions. So this is, a, this is a partial incision at a week and a partial incision, I think that's about maybe five, six months out. And then this is a Japanese lady where I did a full incision technique with, and you can see about a week out, the edema is much more significant to the point of being distorting. And this is about, I think, seven, eight months out. This is about a year out. This is just a full incision technique. And you can see it really opens up that eye and creates a very, very nice look. I know she has a little bit more makeup on the right. So in summary, the key here is to be mindful about ethnicity. And those are things that you, you just don't be a mechanic and look at that 
eyelid, but really think about preserving ethnicity, and we talked about that yesterday. And then just think about that structure about the aging Asian eyelid. I don't, I've, I don't have it written here. Um, someone asked me, have I written this before? It's not in the Asian book, but it's, but it's in a, um, a clinic's uh, facial plastic surgery last year edited by David Kim called Asian Face or something. Uh, so if it's the first article in that, that book if you want to read sort of the encapsulation of how I approach the aging Asian eyelid. Um, and these are just a couple books I've written. So I appreciate your attention.